Okay, so as I mentioned, this is on <coughs> chapter five. And essentially, we're colouring in. So up until now, all of the, um, how we've defined our virtual world has been in, in the form of vertices and polygons. Okay, so these polygons are made, are defined by edges that join up vertices. So if we were just to restrict ourselves to that, we'd only have wireframe, what we call wireframe graphics. Okay, but as you probably all know, modern graphics, or since the sort of late, 80s haven't been wireframed and they've used something called filling so that's what we're going to be looking at today so how do we fill in a polygon okay, so there are going to be two main methods we're going to be looking at okay uh, this is our problem so if we've got a polygon which is defined as a, a polygon is simply a closed curve with edges which are straight lines so it could be a triangle simplest polygon quadrilateral uh, five-sided, six-sided, it could be n-sided, it doesn't really matter. Um, the problem we've got is we want to fill um, all the pixels which are within a polygon, we want to fill them with some colour. And the problem there is we don't want to have any holes. Okay, so every pixel within the polygon should be drawn. Um, only those pixels with a the polygon should be filled, i.e. any pixels outside of our polygon should be ignored. If a pixel is already illuminated, i.e. it's already been coloured in something, then the algorithm should ignore it. So, for example, if we've already filled that pixel, we don't want to have to repeat any calculations. Okay, and there are two main approaches, and we'll be using both, or we'll be looking at both approaches. So the first thing we can do is we draw the outline of the polygon. And to do that, we can use Brushenham's algorithm, which we looked at last week. So Brushenham's algorithm, just how do we draw a straight line on a pixel array, on a raster? So remember we talked about rasterization. It's going from your idealized image to an approximation using pixels. Okay, so you can draw the outline of a polygon using Brushenham's algorithm. Then once you've got the outline, Pick a point within your polygon, and that's your start point, and then you fill all the pixels within that polygon. So if you think of like a drawing package, so you know, MS Paint or something like that, if you draw a loop, it could be a loop, could be a circle, could be a rectangle, etc. and you click on the fill sort of tool, click somewhere inside, and all those pixels with inside get filled that color. So that's what we call uh, that's the first approach, what we call flood fill. The second approach is where we draw the polygon including interior pixels, line by line. Okay, and that approach is normally is one usually used for virtual worlds. The first approach tends to get used for things like drawing packages. If you want to draw a picture and put fill in the area. The second approach tends to be for sort of games or movies or whatever, but when we've got some form of virtual world. Okay, so the first approach is what we call the flood fill, because from a starting point within our polygon, it fills out, it floods out from that starting point. Um, and it fills out pick one pixel at a time. So the flood fill algorithm only considers a pixel at a time. So you might have thousands of pixels, so it is kind of, it's not a particularly efficient method, but it does, it does the job. So we start with a pixel which is known to be in the interior of the polygon. And what we have is we have the idea of two colors. We have a target color. That's the, that's the color of the pixel which we're gonna overwrite with our new color. So for example, the target color could be white or could be not black. Okay, any sort of blank pixel we wanna color it in. And we have a replacement color. And that's the color that you want to color in. So let's say your target color is white and your replacement color could be red. So if we encounter a white pixel, we're going to overwrite that with a red. Okay, so we have two colors, target and replacement. If we encounter a pixel that isn't the target color, we simply move on. For example, the outside of your polygon, your outline, 
won't be the target color. So when, when, when we get to the outline, we don't overwrite that. If the pixel color is changed, so if we have a target color, we would change it with a replacement color, we move to the east pixel and start again. So by east, I mean we move the pixel to the right. If, however, that east pixel can't be filled, we try and go to the west, or then we check the north, and then we check the south. So I'm going to be referring to sort of neighboring pixels as east, west, north, and south. Okay, so that's the flood fill algorithm. Um, I've written, uh, this is a sort of thing. Okay, I've got a very, very simple 10 by 10 raster array. And on this, I've just drawn a four-sided quadrilateral polygon. Okay, so if I was to use Bresham's algorithm to draw the outline, it would look something like that. I know it's blocky. It's quite low resolution, but it's, you know, I've blown it up on purpose just to, so you can see. And we start with a pixel in the middle. So my replacement color is going to be white. Sorry, my target color is going to be white. My replacement color is going to be red. So if I if I come across a white pixel, I'm going to replace that with a red pixel. If I come across a gray pixel, I'm going to ignore it because it's not my target color. Okay, so I filled that one in. Go to the east. I can fill that one in. If I go to the east again, I can fill that one in. But if I try and go to the east now, what's happened is, well, I'm, I've come across a grey pixel. That's not my target colour. I can't fill that. So we go in other directions. So if I was to sort of carry on, okay, what happens is starting with this target pixel, you tend to have this sort of flooding out of the colour. Okay, so just sort of try to give it a bit of an animation, but so you, you have this sort of approach. Okay, so from the start point, it just fills out all pixels one by one, one pixel at a time. Okay, so this is the algorithm. This is the bottom of page 79. Uh, so we have a function here, and we have various inputs to our function. The raster is actually a pixel array, okay, so that's how many pixels you have on your screen. Uh, X and Y is the coordinates of the initial start pixel. Okay. Target is your target color, so that will be that will be three numbers, red, green, blue. Remember, when we deal with colors, we have three numbers. First number is how, many, how much red do we want, second number is how much green. Third number is how much blue, and we combine those to make the colors. And we also have a replacement color. That's what we want to override it with. And you do a simple test. If the color of pixel at x, y is not equal to target, then you exit. Okay, so the first test we do is a test for whether we, whether we exit that function or not. If we don't have something which is equal to our target color, we exit. If, however, we haven't exit the function, we set the um, current pixel at x, y to be equal to the replacement color. And then we call the function itself. So notice this function is called flood fill. Okay. We call the function itself, but with the pixel to the west. So I add one to my x coordinate. So that's going, sorry, pixel to the east. So that's going one to the east, and we should do it again. So imagine we've gone to the east, okay? So in now in this function, we we test whether we have a replacement color or whether we exit or not. If we don't, we fill in that color. Then we go again to the east, and we keep going until we exit. Okay. So if we exit, then we try and go to the west. Okay, and we do the same. If we can't go to the west, we go to the north. And if we can't go to the north, we go to the south. Okay, so this is the flood fill algorithm. Very, very simple. Okay, um, one thing about this is these 
where we call a function within itself, it's called a recursion, a recursive call. And I'll mention a bit more about this in a minute. Okay, so that's the algorithm. I've got a sort of, I don't know whether it's come out very well on your sort of uh, black and white. Okay, I, I should use different colours of red or blue. But uh, yeah, they, they look too similar when they're uh, printed in black and white. But this is what I meant to have. Okay, so I have uh, tried to do it as simple as possible. I've got a square polygon where I've labelled the pixels A through to Y. So here we have a square. Here's the outline. And I said, okay, I'm going to start with pixel M. This is my centre. Uh, we can fill M and we move east. Okay, so we, we fill M, so that's this bit, and then we move east. Okay, so moving across, I can fill N because it's white, so I can replace that with red, and then I move to the east. When I get to O, O is not equal to the target colour. It's not white, it's blue, so it's the outline. So I can't fill that, so I go back. Okay, so I've gone to the east. Now I can't go any further to the east. So now I exit that function and go to the west. Okay, but I can't go to the west because um, from N, M has already been filled. So I don't want to fill that again. So the next direction I ch check is to the north. Okay, and I go up to S. Okay. Now S is... Uh, white currently, so I replace that with red, and then I try to go to the east from S. But if I go to T, T is not white, T is not the uh, target color, so then I have to go to west to R. Okay, and I keep going check east, check west, check north, check south. So from R, I try and go back to the east to S, that's already been filled, so then I go to Q. Okay, I can fill Q, uh, and from Q, I try and go east to R, but I can't. I try and go west to P, but I can't. I try and go north to V, again, I can't, but I can go south. So then we go to L. And again, L, can't go east, west, or north, so again, I go south to G. <coughs> from G, I, can't, I can go east to H, and then from H, east to I. Okay, so it's kind of like um, you check east, west, north, and south. It's not clever. So, so sometimes it was, it was obvious. So, for example, on this, when we've just done M and we moved east to N, uh, sorry, when we've just done S and moved east to R, I first check east. Well, that's quite <coughs> obvious. You can't go back. we just come from there. It's not clever, but it's just sort of very, very simple. Check east, west, north, south. Okay, and that's the flood fill, and that will fill all of those pixels in an interior of this polygon. Okay, so what disadvantages to this? It's a very simple method. Um, flood fill algorithm is what we call recursive. It calls itself. Okay, so uh, if you have a Google recursion, it's quite a funny thing. It will just Google recursion for you over and over again. These uh, tend to use, recursive algorithms tend to use lots of memory because it's having to keep track. Think of, have you ever seen the film Inception? It's kind of like you're in a dream, in a dream, in a dream. It's like that. So imagine, right, you're in a dream and you're in your dream, you then dream. And then in that dream, you then dream. That's kind of like the closest I can really get to recursion. So you're at several levels down. The computer's going to have to keep track the memory of what's going on in all those levels. And indeed, MATLAB will have a mode if you try and use the flood fill algorithm. So I think I've got MATLAB actually open here. Okay, so here I've got a little program. I've got a 100 by 100 raster array. I'm going to define a polygon. And then I'm going to try and, uh, so that, that polygon just gets um, plotted using Bresham's algorithm. Then I'm going to use flood fill. Okay. And doesn't like it. Okay, I reach 500 levels of recursion, and then MATLAB has a limit. It goes right any more than that, 
you're going to have memory issues. So it doesn't like it. I could change the limit, but if you do that, you tend to crash the computer. So I don't bother. Okay, uh, just to, I was just going to show you without the fill. Okay, so that was what I had. Okay, that was a sort of just a generic uh, polygon. Uh, notice it's concave. So by co uh, concave means if I draw if I draw a line between this point and let's say this point, it crosses the outside. Okay. So what I did, what I tried to do is fill this polygon in with a colour, and you can see MATLAB didn't like it. Okay. So you might think, okay, well if it didn't like it, how how do how do our paint programs how do they work? Okay. Wrong one. Okay, another disadvantage, which is not really a disadvantage, but if, you, if you've got, a, let's say this is a polygon, but you've got sort of two edges which are sort of diagonally opposite each other, if we were to fill this bit with a flood fill, it would get, oops, <coughs> I haven't seen that before, tick. Okay, it would get uh, sort of blocked by this tight corner. Okay, That's not really a disadvantage, it's just something to be aware of. Sometimes when you're messing about with paint programs, that happens. You're trying to fill a whole bit in. There's a few pixels which aren't aren't filled. Oops. Okay, and this is what I meant by the recursion. Uh, it calls itself. So think of the sort of inception analogy. If you if you're in a dream within a dream within a dream, etc. So we started at our pixel M, and then we went to N. So there was a function call for N. Then we went to S, the function call for S. And as you go down deeper and deeper and deeper, okay, so for that example, the one on the previous slide, we have several layers or several levels of recursion. It's, in general, that's bad programming practice. Okay. There are some times when it's unavoidable, but in general, that's bad. Okay, so that was nine <laughs> pixels. The computer was having to remember all of, the, all of this stuff. You've got thousands of pixels usually within polygons, so it's no good. The way around that is to use what we call a queue, a LIFO. Have you seen this in any form of OR or decision mass? LIFO stands for last in, first out. So imagine you're in a queue, you've got a queue for <coughs> bar or a queue for post office or something. Last person for the queue is the first person to go out. Okay. Um, and we use a queue-based method to um, avoid that recursion. But what we do is we start the queue with our start pixel. So we have a queue. At the, at the beginning, our queue is empty. So we fill it with one pixel, which is our start pixel. Each step of the method, we take the last pixel and remove it, check to see if it can be filled, if it can, we replace it with its four neighbouring pixels, east, west, north, south. And we add that to the end of the queue. And then we take the last one in the queue again and do the same thing. The algorithm <coughs> terminates either when, well, when the queue is empty. Okay, so that's the algorithm. So this is what I call a LIFO, last in, first out method. So we start a queue, well we start an empty queue but initialize it to the start pixel and whilst our queue is non-empty, so whilst there's something in the queue, you take the last one in your queue okay, and take it away, remove it. If the colour of that last pixel is the same as the target colour, then you fill it and then you add its neighbouring ones to the queue. Okay, you keep doing that until you finish. So notice there's no recursion here. We don't need to call a function within a function. Okay, so here's a sort of um, same example again. So if we start with M, we have M in our queue. Now because there's only one, that has to be the last one. So we remove M. We check whether it can be filled. It can, so we fill it. And then add its neighbours. So we add N, L, R, and H, because they're the east, west, north, south neighbours. So now we've got four in the queue. 
So H is the last one. So we remove H and check it. So H is here, so it can be filled, so we fill it. Then we replace it with I, G, M, and C. Okay, we, our last one in the queue now is C. Now C is not the target color. So we take it out, have a look at it. Okay, we can't, um, we can't fill that one, so we discard it. The next one is M. The thing is M's already been filled. So we can't fill it, so we discard it. And the next one is, oops, sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong way. The next one is G. Now, G can be filled. So we fill it and then add its neighbors, H, F, L, and B. Okay? And we keep going. Take the last one, B. Well, B can't be filled. So then go to L. L can be filled. So we fill L and then add its neighbors. Okay, and we keep going in that respect. Okay, so take the last one, check it, discard it if you can't, if it's not equal to the target color. If it is equal to the target color, fill it in, add its neighbors. Okay, and then we get to the last cue is that one. All of those can't be filled, so they all just disappear one by one. We take them, we take them from the cue and take them out. Okay, so that was the LIFO cube-based flood fill, and that's the one that your paint programs use. Okay, that's how we fill in that sort of, that polygon. And that's what you get um, if, you, if you try and use the, uh, the same, that's the same program, but using the LIFO fill. I think I've got an example here. Okay, so, that, so that, that's the, if you wanted to see, this is not something which is, you'll be asked to do, but just in case you wanted to see. Um, start with the, your X and Y coordinates, so that's the starting, right, so while Q is not empty, uh, remove the last one from Q, get color of the last, so that's, check its color. If the last color is equal to target, replace it, and then add the east, west, north, and south neighbors. Okay, and if you were to do the um, that for this flood fill, you can see it's all filled in, all of the interior <coughs> pixels are filled in and done it all right. So that's how your uh, paint programs fill in pixels. Okay, so that's, that's the first approach. It tends to be slow. It's not used for any form of games or any form of virtual world because it's too slow. Um, but it has its usage in um, art and, you know, these art packages you get. Okay, uh, scan line filling is the other method. Now, this one tends to be used um, the majority of the time. Okay, and a scan line is simply a name given to a horizontal row of pixels. And when you're looking at a computer screen or a TV screen, your scan, there are a number, all the horizontal pixels, <coughs> horizontal rows, that's a scan line. So if you've got a 1080p TV, there, is 100, there are 1,080 scan lines. Okay, that's how it goes, horizontal rows. And if you were to um, sort of get a high, um, high frequency uh, video camera and record a television, you'll see it sort of goes from the top to the bottom. And what it's doing is it's taking each scan line at a time. And that's what scanline filling does. <coughs> so the scanline algorithm loops through rows of pixels and where the edges of the polygons intersect with your rows of pixels, with your scan line, okay, we have what we call scan extrema. So if you have a horizontal line, at some point that horizontal line is going to intersect with your edges of your polygon. And these are called scan extrema. Okay, uh, we calculate the scan extrema using linear interpolation. Okay, so edges of polygons are all straight lines, so we can just use interpolation between the endpoints. Then we sort scan extrema into ascending order by the x coordinate, and then all the pixels between pairs of your scan extrema are then filled. Okay, so this is what scan line filling looks like. So here I have the same. 10 by 10 raster arrays before, the same um, 
polygon outline. So what you do is you start at the top of the polygon, and I'll fill in that pixel there. That's my first scan line. So, so the very top scan line doesn't intersect with my polygon at all. So there's nothing there. The second scan line, okay, I've got an intersection here. So I fill in that pixel. And I go down to the next one. Okay. I've got one scan extremer here. And I've got another one here. So I fill in all the pixels between those two. And you just keep going line by line, all the way down, until you fill that polygon. I know that's quite a low resolution. It kind of looks blocky, but that's how it works. So this is, well, this is the algorithm. So with the scan line filling, you have to give it a set of vertices. They're your corners of your polygons. And you've got a, a color of the polygon color. Okay. Uh, first, we have to calculate the slope of each edge. So delta x and delta y, that just means a change in the x coordinate for the two endpoints um, for that edge. So you, let's say you've got three edges. It's a triangle. So you'll have three slopes. So you calculate slopes first. And then you loop through the scan lines. So that's going from top to bottom for each edge. So we've got a couple of nested loops here. So OK, we loop through all scan lines. That's all your rows of pixels. You then loop through all your polygon edges. So if you've got triangles, you've got three edges. Quadrilateral, you've got four. And then you do a little test. If your edge intersects with the scan line, then calculate the x coordinate of that intersection. And that's a scan extremer. Once you've done all that for the current line, so you've gone round, round your polygon, Sort the scan extremer into ascending order by your x coordinate, and then illuminate the pixels between pairs of scan extremer. Okay, so as always with algorithms, it's a lot easier to sort of step through um, an example. Okay, so here's a sort of um, I've deliberately chosen a concave um, polygon rather than convex, just so we we got this sort of multiply connected region down here. And it can still handle that. Okay, so what I've got here, I've got an eight-sided polygon. So V1 through to V8 are my vertices. Okay. Um, let's say we've got a scan line here. So that dotted line is my horizontal scan line. So what I then do is you go through each edge of your uh, polygon. So V1 to V2, nowhere near crossing. So uh, V2 to V3 the same so we keep going around the edges okay so none of those intersect but eventually we do get an intersection so the edge v6 to v7 intersects at x1 so we calculate what that x1 coordinate is we don't need to calculate what the y coordinate is because the y coordinate is simply one minus the previous scan line so the top scan line will, will have a y coordinate the next scan line down would just be that minus one. So the y coordinate is easy to calculate. The x we have to interpolate between uh, v6 and v7 to get that point. Okay, seven to eight, they're fine. They, they don't cross. The eight to one crosses at x2. So we've got to calculate what x1 and x2 are. Okay, so those are our scan extrema. Sort them in ascending order. So on the previous slide, we had x1 on the right, x2 on the left. x1 has a larger value than x2. OK, so we just flip them around. We sort them into an ascending order. So our first scan extrema is here as we go from left to right. And our second one is here. And then we just fill in all the pixels between x1 and x2. Okay. Um, if, we, if we move down a bit. Okay, so I've, I've just done this example just to show you that where we have multiply connected, sort of what we call multiply connected regions, it can still cope with it. So here, V1 to V2 doesn't intersect, but 2 to 3 does. 3 to 4 doesn't, but 4 to 5 does. Okay, so we've got to check each edge of our polygon. We keep going around, okay, we end up with 4 
intersection points. But here we have x1 is this point, x2, x3, and x4 is on the left over here. So what we do now do is we sort them into ascending order by their x coordinate. Okay, so I say this is my x1, that's my x2, there's my x3, and that's my x4. And then between two pairs, I fill in all the pixels between those pairs. So we fill in the pixels between x1 and x2, but we don't fill them in between x2 and x3. And then we do again. And we don't, and we do. So it can sort of deal with various sort of weird convex, uh, sorry, concave polygons. In general, graphics, we t tend, to, tend to avoid uh, concave polygons. We tend to like convex because they're easier to work with. But that's the uh, scanline method. It's all very well doing that method. It's quite easy to explain, quite easy to understand. So, the sort of tricky thing is calculating the coordinates of the scan extremer. And we just use linear interpolation. So, if you recall, the Cartesian equation of a line is y equals gradient times x plus constant, which is just where it crosses the y axis. If you know the coordinates, so let's say we know what these coordinates down here are. So, x i, y i. We can calculate C. Okay, so C is easily calculated by yi minus the gradient times xi. And if we substitute C back into the equation, we get this. Okay. And we have I've rearranged a bit here. So instead of having y the subject, which we have up here, I've rearranged it to make x the subject. Okay. So notice the it's delta y over delta x there but it's delta x over delta y because I've rearranged it. So what this means is we can calculate our x coordinate of our scan extremer. If we know xi and yi, which is this point, or it could be that point, doesn't matter which one. We know what delta x and delta y are, which is just delta x is the horizontal distance, delta y is the vertical distance. And we also need to know this y coordinate. Now that y coordinate is simply every time we go down a scan line, it's simply minus one. So to calculate y, we simply subtract one. Then we have that y coordinate there, and then we can simply calculate the x coordinate using this um, equation. That delta x over delta y, it's going to be constant. So the gradient all along this line here is the same wherever we are because it's a line. Okay, so this can be calculated before we have to um, step through the method. Okay, so that, that can speed it up slightly. So there's the coordinates of the scan extremer. So our new y coordinate is y minus one. Our new x coordinate is given by that equation there. Delta x over delta y is constant. It can be pre-calculated to save effort. Uh, we do have a problem. If the edge is horizontal, which means delta y will be equal to zero, the problem is we'd be dividing by zero. So in this step here, if, if we had a horizontal line, okay, we'd be dividing by zero. So what we do is we calculate the gradient as being delta x over delta y. If y is not zero, if it is zero, we just say it's zero. Okay, a um, bit of MATLAB code. This is not something you'd be asked to do. Okay, it's just, just for, your, uh, for your info, really. Okay, so for a scan line, we, have, we start with a raster. P are the sort of points uh, for your polygon, and color is whatever color you want to fill it in. Uh, so the first, this first loop here, that loops for the number of vertices in your polygon, and it simply calculates the slope. So if you're changing the y, uh, sorry, changing the x coordinate is uh, negative, the x is zero, else we have whatever the slope is. Okay, and, and this one though goes to the scan lines. For, from y, from top, increment minus one to bottom. 
So that increment means it's going down every time y is subtracted by 1. A uh, bit of logic here, determine whether scanline intersects with the current edge. Okay, so there's just a bit of logic to do that. If it does, uh, n scan x means how many scan extremes do we have? Usually you'll have two. You have to keep, in, um, you have to keep track of that. And then scan x is simply your x coordinate. So that means scan extrema. Down here we sort your scan extrema into ascending order. And then you just fill in pairs of pixels between those. Okay. As you can see, all the scanline method does is just fill all pixels. Uh, notice there's no outline. Okay, the flood fill method required an outline. It required sort of a border for your polygon. Scanline, it just it just does the whole thing. Uh. Okay, I've got a couple of um, videos which I, I made um, a while ago, actually, just to uh, sort of show you it in action. Okay, so that's that's what's happening with that um, polygon. Notice I've had to do it at a lower res just to speed it up. But you can see it sort of floods out from the middle. And it, eventually it does cover all polygon, uh, all, all pixels within that polygon. Takes a while. But obviously, I, I've slowed it down. I've deliberately added a pause in there. Okay, so that's that's how flood fill does it. Scanline fill in is a lot more uh, boring because it's so quick. It sort of does it. There you go, top to bottom. <laughs> What the hell was that? <laughs> Don't know what that was. But... Nothing I added on to it, by the way. I'm not that... Uh... <laughs> okay, so scanline filling is the one which we tend to use. Um, much, much faster than flood fill. It uses what we call scan coherence. So there's no need to check every pixel. We just have whole rows of pixels. We only check whether they're the edges of the, um, the scan extrema. Doesn't need the polygon to be plotted beforehand, so we don't actually bother plotting the polygon. We just pass the polygon information to the, to the scan extrema algorithm, and then it'll do the rest. Uh, as I mentioned, uses scan coherence, doesn't have to check every interior pixel. And it's used in lighting models. Okay, so it's used in lighting models and texture mapping. I said next two weeks there, um, in a minute, I'm going to go on to talk about lighting. Okay, so we're going to be talking about lighting. Next week, we'll be talking about texture mapping. Both methods use scanline filling. Okay. Are there any questions about filling? Fairly sort of straightforward, fairly sim simple. If you do sort of have to program it, there are, it's a bit, um, niggly to program but it's not something you'll be asked to do it's not something on your um, assignments in an exam situation you'd probably be asked to explain what flood fill and what scanline filling are uh, you won't necessarily be asked to sort of uh, implement it on anything you might have to explain what it is and also maybe linear interpolation as well right so that's filling okay uh, next thing i wanted to go on to yeah, let's find the, uh, yeah. And this is lighting. Hey, they're, they're, uh, this is on to the, the next. Yes, this is the next chapter. By the way, the figures in this chapter, they look lovely when they're in colour. But notice in black and white, they tend to look a bit poor. So if you get a chance, have a look at the PDF of Moodle for, um, for how those figures should look. Right, so we're going to be looking at what we call a direct lighting model. There are two different types of model, of lighting models. There's what we call direct and what we call global. Now, global lighting models are things which are used in, like, for example, the Pixar films. Okay. Pixar films are what we call pre-rendered. Okay, so when, when you play a Pixar film, the computer's not having to calculate all the lighting on the fly. 
So it can take it can take all the time it needs to sort of pre-render and deal with all the lighting. Um, now a global lighting model, what it does is for each pixel, it sends out a ray of light to whatever surface you have in the virtual world, and then that ray of light will ping off the surface, it will be reflected, hit something else, hit something else, etc. Okay, and that's what we call ray tracing. Okay, um, that's very very expensive. It takes hours to do that for a single frame. So it's no use in a virtual environment. So virtual environment use a simplification called direct lighting. Why do we need lighting? Well, we've just done filling. Okay, so what I've got here is I've got the Newell's teapot. Okay, the image on the left is a 3D image. So all I've done is, you know, the Newell's teapot, which I've showed you, I've just filled it, all of them equal to red. Okay, using, well, whatever MATLAB uses, probably Scanline, Billy. Okay, that is actually a 3D object. We haven't a clue that it's 3D, it just looks 2D to us because we don't know what the sort of geometry of the object is. If we add lighting, now this is exactly the same object, haven't done anything to it, any, any sort of changes in the vertices or coordinates or anything. And the one on the right is we've added, well, I've added a direct lighting model to it. And you can see, immediately we can see that it's a 3D object. Okay, so lighting in shadow helps us to determine what the shape of objects are. Remember, we're looking at it on a 2D screen. So lighting really does help sort of to improve the realism. Um, so I mentioned, I mentioned direct and global illumination. Now, direct illumination, uh, I assume you all know that light sort of tends to travel in straight lines. Okay, so if you've got, we've got a number of light sources in the ceiling here, Okay, light will travel through space in a straight line. I know there are things like, um, did you see that announcement about gravity waves last week? Yeah. Okay, I'm not going into, uh, it's something beyond my comprehension to go into um, space time. But let's say light travels in a straight line. Okay, so a light source could be anything, could be the sun, could be a light bulb, something like that. Okay, light travels in a straight line, it hits a surface or an object, and it is reflected. Usually it's reflected um, at the same angle it hit it, so angle of, what we call angle of incidence. And then that light eventually reaches your eye. Okay, so everything you're seeing is, uh, you're not actually looking at, when you see an object, you're not seeing the object, you're seeing light bouncing off of that object. Okay, so it's kind of like, almost sort of philosophical point. You, you don't actually see objects, you're seeing what light bounces off of them. So that's, a, well, that's what we call direct illumination. Now, in real world, it's more complicated than that, okay? Light bounces off of other objects and, hits and bounces off of other objects and so on and so forth. So this is what we call an indirect illumination. So here's a light source. This ray of light happens to hit this object, bounces off this object, and then eventually gets to the viewer. Okay, this is difficult to do. This is what we call ray tracing. And that's done, you know, the Pixar films or any of your sort of CG in films, that's what that does. And that requires lots of computing power to pre-render. Okay, if you're playing a game or you're in a virtual world, we can't do that, so we use only direct light. And there are other tricks you can do to try and make it look a bit better. You can add shadow and things like that. Right, so that's what we're going to focus on. We're going to focus on this direct illumination. Um, and the direct illumination model we're going to look at combines three different types of reflection. We call it ambient, diffuse, and specular. Okay, now I'm going to do a little experiment. Uh, probably won't work. Uh, no, it's not working because I've got the um, I've got the uh, screen on. Let's see if I can blank that screen. Uh, turn that off. Try and cover this up. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, we, 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 I'm not allowed to turn off the. Um, I'm pointing at the um, X emoji. The X. I'm not allowed to turn them off. Anybody seen the Steve Jobs film? Yeah. yeah when he said, "Oh, turn them off," it affects it. Yeah. No, I'm not allowed to turn them off. Anyway, but you can still see. I can still see. Well, 
you can make just about make shapes out, can't you? Yeah, and that's because of ambient light. Okay, that didn't work as much well as I hoped. If I had blackout curtains and things like that, I could do it. Ooh, that's too bright. <laughs> okay, ambient light is reflection of light that does come does not come directly from a light source. So even if you were to turn off all lights in a room, after a while you could barely make out edges of objects. This is because what little light you do have is bouncing around inside the room, off of objects, and eventually it goes to your eye. Okay, so that, that's the sort of second bullet point there. Okay, so we can make out the edges of objects. Okay, this is because the light bounces around all over the place. Now, Fong is the name of the model we're, we're going to be uh, using. Is what we call a direct lighting model. We assume that the light, ambient light, falls equally on all objects. So very, very simple assumption. So if you if you want to deal with ambient reflection, rather than looking at all the light bouncing off of all objects, we just say, well, it's equal for every object. Okay. And so we have this mathematical model here. Your A, that's the amount of ambient reflection. Okay is equal to IA times KA. Now, there are going to be lots of um, variables explained in this part of the lecture, okay? Um, and I'll keep going back over them. Um, I <coughs> refers to intensity. So this big I here, that's intensity. So that's how bright something is. So the ambient lighting model is IA, which is the intensity of the ambient light, multiplied by KA. Now, Ka is, is like, a, like a tuning parameter. Okay, Ka is in the range 0 to 1. So if Ka is close to 1, it means we've got a very bright ambient light. Okay, it's a way of turning something up and down. But if Ka is set to nearly 0, we've got very dark or very little ambient light. So if you're, let's say you're in a virtual world and it's a daytime scene, you'd have Ka being quite close to 1. If, however, you're in a nighttime scene, you want things to be darkened, you set K or Ka close to 0. So it's a very, very simple model. Every object in your virtual world is lit equally. Okay. And that's ambient reflection. So uh, Here I've, done, I've drawn Newell's teapot. Okay, I've done it in blue, and I've done it with different sort of values of Ka. So as you ramp up Ka, you can actually see more of the teapot. It gets, it gets lighter. Okay, so that's what we call ambient reflection. That's the simplest of all our reflection models. Okay, so first one's ambient. Everything's illuminated the same. The second one is called diffuse reflection. Now, diffuse reflection is reflection of light off of rough surfaces. If you have a look at the, for example, the material on these chairs, they're quite rough. Okay, so that's what we call diffuse reflection. The carpet, anything which is not shiny. Okay, so what happens is you have incident rays. So these come in from a light source. We assume if the light source is sufficiently far away, they, they'll be parallel, but that, that wouldn't really happen in practice. Okay, so as the incident rays hit a rough, uneven surface, they're bounced off all over the place. Okay, they're, they're not bounced off in the same direction, they can be bounced off all over the place. And that's what happens when light falls on something which is rough. So, Fong, um, be, uh, Biu Fong, he was in the, in the early 70s, his model, what he decided to do was represent that using vectors. Okay, so what we have here is just a diagram. So that's my sort of, well, our um, surface. And that, let's say our light is up here. Okay, this is where our light source is. By convention, we tend to say the light source vector goes from the surface pointing to the light source. Okay, it can be the other way around, doesn't matter, you just use minus L, we just sort of change the sign of L. Okay, when your light source is close, or the L vector is actually quite close to the normal vector, 
So the angle between them, I don't know whether you can see, there's a, there's a theta parameter there. When theta is quite small, you've got lots of light being uh, thrown out. Okay, lots of light being reflected off of that surface. Okay, but as the light source, or the angle between the light source and the normal vector gets greater, you've got less light sort of bouncing off. Okay. Notice for all of these blue vectors here, they're all sort of being equally scattered in all directions. Okay, that's sort of the model of that scattering from the earlier slide. So as the theta um, angle gets bigger and bigger and bigger, you notice the magnitude of these vectors getting smaller and smaller. There's less light being um, reflected off of um, this rough surface. So we're assuming it's rough. Obviously, the math in, in your sort of, um, let's say these are polygons, they're flat. Geometrically speaking, they're totally flat. But we're trying to model a rough surface. So we've got light scattering equally in all directions. Now, when the light source is alongside the surface, so the angle is pi over 2 or greater, so 90 degrees or greater, we've got no light being scattered. So the amount of light which is reflected off the rough surface is dependent upon the angle between the light source vector and the normal vector. The smaller the angle, the more light that comes off. If the angle is 90 degrees or greater, so 90 degrees here, if it's greater, it means the light source is behind the object, so it's in shadow. There's no light given off. Okay, so Fong's model looks like this. So what we have is, remember I said that big I tends to be intensity. Well, we had big I A, which was, that was a general intensity of the ambient light. Big I P is the intensity of a point light source. Now, the point light source, for example, is one of these uh, light bulbs in the ceiling. So how many have we got? There are 20 light bulbs in the ceiling, so we've got 20 point light sources here. And we've got some, there's one coming from the projector, there's one from this phone and my computer and what have you. Okay, so IP is the intensity of the point light source. KD is similar to KA, it's just the number between zero and one. How much diffuse reflection do you want to give off from that object? You decide that. If you've got a very rough object, KD might be large. If you've got a shiny object, KD might be, it might be close to zero. So this is sort of like the amount of roughness. It's called the diffuse coefficient. So how much diffuse reflection do you want to give off? And that um, just depends on what, what you're modeling, what object you have. And theta is obviously the angle, well, as I mentioned before, the angle between the normal vector and the, and the light vector. Okay, notice we have a little max here, max cos theta zero, because as soon as theta gets greater than 90 or pi over 2, that becomes negative. Okay, so rather than returning a negative, I just say, what's the maximum between that and zero? So, that, so the minimum that that will give is zero, the maximum it will give is one. Okay. Well, cosine is an expensive calculation. We can simplify that by using dot products. So remember that the definition of a dot product. So here I have two vectors, A and B, and the angle theta between them. The definition of A dot B is the, magnitude, the product of their magnitudes multiplied by the cosine and the angle between them. Well, I only wanted the cosine. I don't really want the magnitude. So what we do is we assume, or we let, we make sure that L and N are unit vectors. So they've got a magnitude of one. So if my light source vector is a unit vector, and so is my normal, that surface, dot product them together, I get cos theta. Okay, so we can replace the cosine calculation with a dot product calculation as long as they're unit vectors. Okay, and that's my diffuse, <coughs> excuse me, that, well, my, not mine, it's Fong's diffuse model. So we've got an ambient model, that's everything, sort of light bouncing off of everything, everything's treated the same way. We've got a diffuse reflection model. This is modeling rough surfaces. 
Okay. And that's the Mule's teapot. Again, it's not really that obvious. Um, I'd recommend uh, if you download the slide um, for this, you can actually see it, see it a bit better on your computer screen or what have you. And I've just ramped up the diffuse coefficient. So when it's low, you can barely see it. It's mostly in shadow. But as it, the diffuse coefficient gets more and more, you can see a bit more of it. It looks a bit washed out sort of when diffuse coefficient is one. So that's modeling a rough sort of, let's say the teapot is like velvet, like a velvet teapot. Whether you want that, I don't know, but it's very rough sort of surface. Okay, so that's ambient and diffuse. The last thing, or the final one, which <coughs> type of reflection we use, is something called specular. And this is shiny objects. This is smooth, shiny surfaces. And what tends to happen is the incident rays get bounced off or reflected at the same angle they hit it. Think of a mirror. Okay, as the light comes into the mirror, it gets reflected out at the same angle. Okay, so this is specular reflection is all about modeling shininess. And this is what Fong's model is based upon. So we have the same surface as before. We have a normal vector and we have a light source vector. And theta is the angle between the normal and the light source. We also have a reflected ray. So if this is my light source vector, L, the reflected ray... Well, the angle between the reflected ray and the normal vector is the same as the angle between the normal vector and the lighting vector. So all light will be reflected. So if this is my light source, it hits the surface and it gets reflected along R. Depending on where the viewer is, they're going to see more of that shininess as they move. Okay, so we have this vector V, which is the viewing vector. Okay, so that eye is meant to be that sort of going into your eye. And we have the angle alpha. Now, alpha is between the reflective vector and the viewing vector. The smaller the angle alpha, the more of that reflective ray you'll be able to see. Okay, the larger alpha is, the less of that reflected ray you should see. Okay, so this is dealing with shininess. So we've got diffuse, which is roughness, specular, which is shininess. Okay, and this specular model, we've got IP, which is exactly the same as the IP in the diffuse model. That's the intensity of the point light source. We've got KS this time, so S for specular. Again, that's a number between 0 and 1. You just set that to whatever you want. Um, how, how shiny you want your object to be. Is it a shiny object? Is it a rough object? You set KD and KS likewise. Then we have the cos to the power n times that angle alpha. So that angle alpha is here. Okay. And this n, the cosine is raised to a power. And that's what we call the specular exponent. <coughs> okay. And that determines how much of the sort of reflected light should the viewer see. Okay, so how does it do that? Okay, so here I've got a graph. Um, this, actually, that really should say alpha, not theta, but it doesn't matter. This is the angle between the viewer and the um, reflected ray on, on the bottom. And at the side, we have cos to the power n of that angle. Okay, so for n, when n is 1, we have the blue line. Okay, so that means... If somebody is around right here, they can see a lot of the light. But as n gets um, as n gets larger and larger, the, the amount of light which is being reflected off narrows. So for example, when n is 50, you can see the black line. Okay, the very narrow band <coughs> of which the light is being reflected off. <coughs> and you set n, you set n and your ks to be how sort of shiny you want your object to be. Okay, and by that I mean, I'm just going to show you, this is Newell's teapot with no ambient reflection, no diffuse, but only specular. And I've got different exponents here. So when n is 50, you've only got a very narrow band of light being reflected off of the teapot. As n gets larger, 
you see more of the reflected light. Okay, so this one down here is a bit, it's a bit much, but you can see we've got some light reflected off the handle and off the face of the teapot. This teapot, believe it or not, is blue. But with specular light, you never see the color of the object. You only see the color of the light source. Okay, so think of a mirror. What color is a mirror? You don't know. Because when you look at a mirror, not the object. Okay, so we have ambient, which is light bouncing around everywhere. It's a simple model. We just apply all objects the same. We have diffuse, which is roughness. Okay, light bouncing off a rough surface. We have specular, which is light bouncing off a shiny surface. Okay, um, how do we calculate that reflection vector? Okay, so to calculate the reflection vector, we use vector projection. Have you seen this in linear algebra, math methods and stuff? Okay, so here I've got two vectors, A and B. Okay, what I want to do is calculate that vector C. So C points in the direction of B, okay, but it's, has, it's kind of like A, like a shadow of A cast onto the vector B. Okay, so it points, C points in the same direction as B, but it has the component of the length of A in that direction. Okay, so if we use a dot product, uh, sorry, dot product, Okay, magnitude of uh, A dot B is magnitude of A times magnitude of B times cosine theta. Should be closed bracket there. Okay, well, the, uh, cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. So that adjacent length there is, a, is the magnitude of C. And a hypotenuse, that length there is a magnitude of A. Okay, so we end up with, we cancel out A dot B is equal to the magnitude of V times the magnitude of C. Divide both sides by the magnitude of B, get A dot V over B. So that's how long our C vector is. So, so the length of the C vector is A dot B over the magnitude of B. Okay. If B is a unit vector, we simply times B by the magnitude of C to give us C. Okay, so B is a unit vector, so magnitude of B would just be 1, so therefore the magnitude of C would just be A times unit vector B, okay, and therefore our C, which is our projection, is equal to A dot B, which is a unit vector, times B. Remember, this dot product would just be a number. That's a number times that unit vector. So that's what we call vector projection. And we use that to calculate the reflected ray. <coughs> so this is how we calculate the reflected vector. So there's my surface, and I have this normal vector. Okay. I have a light source somewhere out there. So that's my light source vector. And I want to calculate R. That's what I want to calculate. Okay, so if that's my light source, and that's R is what I want to calculate. What I can do is if I project L onto N. Okay, so this vector is the projection of L onto the normal vector. So we assume that the normal vector is a unit norm. Well, if I add R to L, okay, so all I've done is taken our vector R and put it on the end of L. So I've added them. What we should find... <coughs> is that is equal to two lots of the projection of L onto N. Okay, so we have this um, expression. L plus R, so that's starting here going L plus R, I end up up here, is the same as two lots of the, of the projection of L onto N. So that one up to there, next one up to there. Okay, well, we wanted to calculate R. We know what L is, we know what N is. So in order to calculate the reflection, that's our, um, that's our expression. So that's one, it's just a simple dot product. 
and multiplication. Right, um, attenuation. This basically means the further you get away from a light source, the dimmer it looks. Okay, so if you've got a candle, so if, you, if you're about 50 feet away from a candle, 50 meters away from a candle, it looks quite dim. If you're close up to the candle, it's brighter. That's, that's attenuation. So light, loss of light energy through space. Um, we can account for this by having a variable or a value, FATT. That's your attenuation factor. And this is applied to um, diffuse and specular reflection because they deal with a point light source. Ambient reflection doesn't deal with a point light source, so how, how far away are you from um, ambient light doesn't, doesn't uh, make any difference. So only applicable to um, diffuse and specular. Now the loss of light energy should follow, theoretically, the inverse square law. So if d is your distance away from the point light source, your attenuation should be one over d squared. So, so if you're 10 meters away, from a light source, FATT would be 1 over 100. Okay. In practice, that tends to make things too dark. Okay, that tends to, you know, make things far too dark. So Fong's model uses this. So 1 minus D over R squared. R is a radius of a light source's sphere of influence. And that's something you set. So if you've got a virtual world and you've got a very bright light source, sphere of influence may be quite far. Else, if you've got like a little torch or a sconch or a candle, your radius of the light source may be quite uh, small. Okay, so this FATT is just some number, usually it's between zero and one, and it just sort of has the effect of reducing the amount of light energy depending on distance away from a light source. Right. So we have three different types of reflection, ambient, diffuse, and specular. We have attenuation. We just add them all together. So this is Fong's reflection model. So I is the intensity of the light. You have your ambient model, which is IA, which is the, amount, the ambient light, times KA, which is the amount of ambient light. You have the diffuse model. <clears throat> So it's FATT, which is your attenuation, times the point light source, times KD, which is your diffuse coefficient, okay, et cetera, plus your specular. Okay, so you, that's for a single light source. Looking around this room, we've got about 30 light sources. Okay, so if you've got multiple light sources, what you do is you add the diffuse and specular components together Okay, you don't do the same for ambient because ambient is doesn't take in, in light source into account. It's just how bright the general uh, scene is. But when you take in, into account the point light sources, you add up all of them. So still quite a bit of work to do. The computer still having to do a lot of work if you've got lighting in a virtual world. So it sums all of these up, and eventually you'll get the intensity. Um, uh, lambda is red, green, blue. So you have to do this for the amount of red light, the amount of green light, and the amount of blue light as well. Okay, so you have to do it for both, all three components. Okay, so that's added them all together. I don't know whether that, it looks less than impressive on the uh, projector, it looks better on the computer screen. So if you just had ambient light, our teapot looks flat, but at least we can see the outline of it. Okay, if you just had diffuse light, okay, you, you can see the, the teapot, but it looks sort of dull. It looks like a rough teapot. If you just had specular, you wouldn't be able to see the teapot at all. You just see the reflection of the point light source off the uh, surface. But if you bung them all together, and again, it doesn't look very good on that projection, but it looks, it looks all right on my screen. So uh, I advise you to have a look at the slides and the notes. The electronic copy. Okay, so that's the direct lighting. Okay, that's what we call Fong's lighting. Right. Just to recap of the variables, there were lots of them. When students sometimes see Fong's lighting model, they think, oh, crikey. Um, I'm not going to ask you to, to calculate this at all. Okay, this is already 
programmed into graphics libraries and things like that. It's quite complicated, but it's more of a general idea which I want you to have. Okay, I is intensity. IA is ambient light, IP is point light intensity. O is object color, I didn't really mention that, but that's red, green, blue. K, all your Ks are just numbers between zero and one. KA is ambient, KD is diffuse, KS is specular. And then think of it like a mixing desk. Okay, when you have an object, you say, okay, I want this to be, I want this to be really shiny and not very dull, so you sort of, you move them up and down. Okay, N is your specular exponent, how much light, how much, what's the band of light which is reflected uh, off your shiny object? FATT is a uh, lot of light source energy over space. L, N, R, and V are your vectors. Okay, so N is from your polygon. Okay. L is the, the vector from your polygon to the light source. R is the reflection, which is calculated using these two. And V is the vector from the, your polygon to the viewer. Okay, um, I mentioned these are already pre-programmed into MATLAB. When I did those, the images of the teapot, okay, um, I used this command, which is material. Okay, so if I wanted something shiny, you just say material shiny, and it makes it shiny. If you want dull, material dull, it makes it dull. Okay, uh, you can have a bit more influence over it. So material K A K D K S. Okay, so that sets the ambient, diffuse, and specular strength of the objects. If you want to also include the exponent, you've got N there. Uh, SC is a specular color. So by default, the color is white. So you think of a white light source. If you wanted it to be a red light source, actually, that's different color, blue light source. Okay, you can set it here. Okay, so you can, you know, MATLAB uses FONG's model. To do to deal with writing, uh, like I say, it's not something which uh, we ask you to do in the assignment. Right, um, I'm going to spend another 20 minutes and then we'll have a break. Okay, um, Fong's writing model like calculates the illumination of a single point. Okay, and obviously in the first half of this lecture. I mentioned about filling, well, we're, we're, we're dealing with lots of points. So we have shading methods, okay? So we apply Fong's, me uh, Fong's lighting model to a single point, okay? Well, what about multiple points, multiple pixels? And there are three methods, okay? Lambertian, Gouraud, or Fong, okay? Uh, okay, well, I've got an idea. Bear with me. This will wake you up. Let's go to my friend YouTube. Any anybody ever seen the Money for Nothing video? Yeah. All right. I, I asked this question last time. Nobody uh, last year. Nobody had a clue. But uh, you got better taste in music, probably. Okay. This was done in like eighty three, eighty four. When graphics were quite new. Yeah. At the time, this was like amazing. So you, you, you recognize the polygon objects. Okay. And you can notice there's lighting in this as well. The 80s were a great time. Check out the headband there. <laughs> yeah, that's enough of that. Right, one thing I wanted to show you is just the um, just the uh, sort of use of the lighting on this. Very, very flat. Okay. So all the polygons, are, all the pixels in the polygons are um, drawn in the same colour. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, that's an example of flat shading. 
Okay, so this is quite a flat shading, it's a simpler shading mo model. Okay, uh, it's often called Lambertian shading. It's a flat, it's uh, easier. And it assumes that all pixels in a polygon are illuminated equally, so they have the same colour. Okay, so it's quite easy to calculate the uh, reflection for one pixel and use that for all others. <coughs> so again, this is not appearing very brightly on the uh, on the screen, but this is uh, just a, what we call peaks function. It's just one of the standard functions in MATLAB just to draw something which is uh, a bit bumpy. Okay, and I've used 25 by 25 polygons for this function, and I've lit it using Fong's reflection model. And you can see that we have sort of this polygon here is very clearly seen. Okay, so that's flat shading. It's easier to do. It requires less computing power, hence why back in the 80s it was used, but it doesn't look very realistic. Now, unfortunately, the reason it doesn't look very realistic is because um, we're animals. Okay. Evolution, okay, we developed eyesight. Um, humans are quite good at running away from predators. Okay, if we see a saber-toothed tiger, we tend to run in the other direction. Likewise, we're quite good at chasing down deer and things like that. Okay, so evolution has given animals with a very good edge detection. Okay, so have a look at this, have a look at this um, picture here. Okay, this is just a, um, just a rectangle. On the left-hand side, it's very, very dark, very black. Uh, on the right-hand side, it's perfectly white. You can take my word for it. I, I can show you the source code used to draw it. I haven't done any shenanigans. But in the middle, I've got a gradual um, sort of lightening of the black. So uh, uh, here we've got 100% black. And as we go into the middle, it sort of gradually goes white. And here we've got 100% white. One thing I want you to notice, and this is different from everyone, so you might not get the same effect. For me, around about there is where it's darkest. Do you know whether you get the same sort of effect? It might look different projecting. Um, for me, it's lightest around about there. Do you know whether you get the same? It's very, very minor, but you can definitely see that. That's because your brain. Evolutionary evolution has given us brains which are very good at detecting shit changes in colour. Okay, it's because saber toothed tigers will be hiding in the bushes waiting to pounce on cavemen type things. Okay, that's called Mac banding. And that's that's what it's sort of you can see. You, you, there's a little this is this red line is what you perceive as the brightness. So when there's a change between dark to light, we see it being darker. Okay, it's a psychological, it's, it's sort of a psychological effect. Likewise, when we change sort of going from darker to light, again, we see it sort of spiking up a bit. That's a problem with flat shading. We're very good at detecting edges of polygons. So the solution is use more polygons. So this is exactly the same image using flat shading but I've used 400 by 400 polygons, okay? And it looks very nice and plasticky and shiny, okay? But that's not, more polygons, more work, that's not a solution, okay? So we, we've got to go back to the drawing board. Okay, so this leads us on to guru shading. Now, is there any French speakers here? Anybody who speak French? Good, because I don't know how to pronounce his name. I think it's Gorod or something. But, uh, Gorod. Anyway, I'm going to I'm going to pronounce it like Gorod. And my apologies if I'm mispronouncing it. Okay, what Gorod shading does is you calculate the reflection model for each of the vertices of your polygon, and then you simply linearly, linearly interpolate across or down the edges and then across the center. So using your scan line filling method. Okay, so there's a scan line. The intensity at pixel A, okay, is interpolated from the intensity at pixel three and the intensity at pixel one. So you calculate the Fong model, the three corners, interpolate down to get A and B, and then you interpolate across to get C. Okay, that's called Gorod shading. 
Um, very popular with games in the 90s, this. Okay, if you, if you got any retro games or back then, they would have used Guru or Chain. Yeah. Uh, the normal vector at the vertices, okay, you might think, well, the normal vector for P1, P2, P3 will all be facing in the same direction. You've got to remember that polygons don't exist on their own. <coughs> they form part of an object. Okay, so what we do is we calculate the, the normal vectors at the vertices by averaging the normals for all polygons that share that vertex. So, for example, imagine a cube. Each corner of the cube um, is shared by three sides. Okay, so you average those three um, normal vectors, you get a normal vector for the corner. Okay, so interpolation, similar to the scanline filling. So if you calculate the intensity at A, um, sorry, calculate the intensity at one, two, and three. Okay, the intensity at um, A, so let's say we know it at this point, when we move down to a scan line, we simply subtract delta IA, and they're calculated down here. So it's just interpolation. These delta IA, delta IB, they're kind of, think of them as gradients. So we're interpolating a value as we go down through the scan lines. Okay, uh, and going across again, so let's say we, got, we know what the value is at CI. If we go to CI plus one, Okay, we, we just calculate delta IC, which is down here. Okay, so it's just interpolation. Okay, and this is the peak function using 25 by 25 polygons. Um, again, it's better to view it on a computer screen, but you can see we, there, it's less obvious where the joins are between different polygons. So that's Guru chaining. It's still not perfect. It still looks slightly sort of, it's removed some of the specular um, shininess of it. Right, and the last one is Fong shading, which same bloke is who developed the, um, the reflection model. Okay, so not it's, it's the same bloke, but different sort of model, different thing. Okay, and what this does is interpolates the normal vectors across your polygon rather than the intensity of the reflection. Okay, so you, you linearly interpolate the normal vectors. So you calculate the normals at the vertices, interpolate them across the sides, and interpolate them across the middle. So each pixel will have a separate normal vector. Then you use that normal vector along with Fong's reflection model and you can apply it for each pixel. Uh, so for example, so let's say at P1 the normal vector is pointing down this way, and P3 is pointing out that way. So down here, if we interpolate for A, it might be pointing along here. Similar for B, it might be pointing up there, and then across the middle. So each point in that, um, in that polygon has a different normal vector. And then we apply the reflection model to that. Okay, and that's the peaks function. So that's the same function, but with just 25 by 25 polygons using Fong shading. So we have three types of shading. Gurud, sorry, flat, Gurud and Fong. Flat was all of them look the same in the polygons. Gurud is where you calculate the reflection at the points, at the vertices, and interpolate. Fong is when you calculate the um, normals at the vertices, interpolate the normals, and apply the reflection. So that was, there's a teapot, uh, and that's with a flat shading, so it looks like the Dire Straits video. Okay, so to do the same teapot with uh, Gurud, okay, so as you can see, it's sort of starting to look more sort of um, same, same amount of polygons, but it's starting to look more sort of rounded. And then finally, Fong is the best one, more vibrant, vibrant spectacular. So that's the three: Gurud, flat, Gurud, and Fong. Okay, so that's I've been talking for an hour and a half now. So um, what I, um, I was thinking, twenty-minute break. And then when we come back, you want to do like an examples class Q&A on the assignments. So any questions you have about the assignments, I may give you some hints, tips, 
how to do them. So if there's something you're stuck on, when we come back, let me know. Okay. Right, it's half past now, so if you want to come back by 10 to, have a coffee and then come back and we'll work on Simon. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.